everybody to the second workshop for the Civil Affairs Conference. And I hope everyone got to listen to General Daniels, General Hooper today, and uh, General Cooley. We're going to continue the conversations of the value that Army Reserve and UCK POC can bring to future battlefields and competition spaces, and also an update on how the command is standing. I'm Colonel Marshall Strauss Scantlin, Director for Strategic Initiatives here at UCK POC at Fort Bragg. It's my pleasure to introduce Brigadier General Jeffrey Coggin, Commanding General for UCK POC. He was born in Pulaski, Tennessee uh, in 1960. Completed his studies at the University of Tennessee and was awarded a Bachelor of Science from the University of, uh, of Tennessee in Agriculture. Commissioned into the Army Reserve as a second lieutenant in the Medical Service Corps. He later transferred to the Civil Affairs Branch. He has completed all professional military education from officer basic course through uh, Army War College and the uh, Joint Combined Warfighting School. He served in a variety of assignments, including environmental science officer for the 49th Civil Affairs Battalion, the liaison officer to the USAID uh, in April 20, 2000 through March 2001 as a public health team chief and a direct support team chief in Afghanistan. He commanded Alpha Company 49th uh, in Iraq during 2004 in Baghdad. In 2006, he assumed command of the 49th through 2011 and deployed them to uh, multinational divisions south. In 2011, he assumed command of the 360th Civil Affairs Brigade Airborne until May of 2012. Then he assumed command of the 321st Civil Affairs Brigade in San Antonio in October 2013 until February 2016. He then took command of the 350th Civil Affairs Command in Pensacola, Florida through 2018. General Coggins, a uh, holder of the Army Superior Unit Award, Joint Meritorious Unit Award, Meritorious Unit Accommodation, Combat Action Badge, Legion of Merit and Bronze Star Medal. And with that, sir. Hey, uh, you always have a pace plan, so I had to go to my backup. Can you hear me and see me now? Where is yours? Yes, sir. Okay. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes sir. We should. We should. Okay, great. Hey, you know, you have to have a pace plan, and that's what I ended up having to do, uh, go to my backup, so sorry about that. Um, the, uh, I ended up uh, some late notice travel today, so I'm also uh, on the go and, and moving, so that kind of disrupted my usual communications and all. So it's great to be with you today. I appreciate the invitation and some time to uh, spend with you. What I'd like to do today is um, I don't have any uh, prepared remarks or anything. I just want to say a few words and then uh, go over some of the things that we have going on at UCK POC and share with you. And then uh, I've also got uh, Colonel Scott DeJesse that's here. I want him to uh, speak about our 38G and, and then we'll open it up for questions because I'm uh, sure that you've got a lot of questions that uh, you'll, you'll want to ask. and. Uh, Look forward to those questions. The, uh, so as the use of KPOC CG, I'm, I'm coming right up on uh, 90 days in the, uh, the seat now. It's been a very fast paced uh, 90 days. Uh, it was short notice when the change was coming, hit the ground running. Uh, a lot of uh, endeavors and things that we had going on uh, at the time of General Guthrie's departure. And so uh, I've taken the ball and, and we're uh, continuing to uh, move forward. The, uh, with that said, uh, you know, I've got my priorities and, and performance objectives that, uh, that I, I have now as the new CG. And my priorities are in line with the Chief of Staff of the Army and the uh, CAR of USART uh, CG. And those uh, consist of people, readiness, modernization, reform, and partnerships. 
Now, within that, uh, I could break that down further, and the first one is soldier readiness. The uh, second one is combat readiness. The third one's organizational readiness, and then uh, finishing up with reform and innovation. The, uh, and what I, what I would say with that is that, you know, we, we've been in a pivotal time uh, within use of KPOC and within the Army. I'm, I know y'all have probably had some other speakers talk to you today, and, and we're looking at, you know, where do we go forward in, in, uh, in the future? Because, you know, we're moving into large-scale combat operations, and that's what our focus and, and uh, priorities are on. And also, uh, with that, the uh, multi-domain operations, and in particular, uh, influence. And where do we, you know, where do we go from there? What are we going to do as an organization uh, moving into multi-domain operations and uh, influence? So what I would share with you on that is that one thing that use of KPOC has that, that really makes us unique is the fact that we have civil affairs, psychological operations and information operations all in the same organization. So uh, that gives us a, a great opportunity going forward into the future. And one of the things that, uh, that I put high priority on is that having those three in one organization is that I challenge every soldier in use of KPOC in all of our branches to break down those barriers and those stovepipes because we empower ourselves and our mission by uh, combining our collective influence and through that being collaborative influencers uh, to do that. And, and I would share with you, it's a very exciting time because uh, we've been moving forward uh, with that, breaking down those stovepipes, changing the culture, working together, uh, and we're, we're seeing the results of that. And I would share with you internally, we started doing that in our CPXs uh, and the uh, PSYOP, CA, IO, having to work together, solve problems together. Uh, we've seen results from that because they realize, hey, I can, I can do this, but if I've got these other two uh, specialties working with me, then it's empowering what I, I can do. And we've all got our place in that. So some of the things we'll be talking about here a little, a little bit further, and I, I'll share some of these up front with you. Uh, one is what are we, what are we doing uh, to empower and uh, uh, take advantage of our collective influence? And I'll be talking to you some more about Operation Dominant Convergence, which is what we're doing within use of KPOC. Uh, to uh, exercise and uh, provide our capabilities out there to the larger force within the, the Army Reserve and, and the Army and the Joint Force uh, to take advantage of that. Uh, another thing I want to talk to you about is what we're doing with our equipment and, and uh, uh, modernization. We have a lot of great stuff going on uh, from that standpoint as well. The, uh, the other thing, I, I mentioned the 38 Gs. I've got Colonel DeJesse here. That's an exciting thing uh, that has really taken a quantum leap over the last year uh, in what we're doing with that, as well as in coordination with SWIC and the proponent. That's been a great win-win uh, and a, a positive story. So we'll talk some more about that. The, uh, the other two things I want to talk about, and this is really a priority for me, having been in use of KPOC uh, for many years and uh, been in, involved with our units, commanding troops, and, and our CTC rotations, NTC, JRTC, and then our exercises as a whole. Uh, we have got to do better in uh, our training and proficiency with our mission command systems and our uh, communication systems. We're just, uh, that's something that really concerns me from the standpoint of readiness and the ability that if we got the call, are we going to be able to go and do what we need to do and communicate? Uh, 
and and link in with the supported command. So that that's an area that uh, I want to speak to. And then another thing that I would share with you that's re really facilitated uh, a lot of things that we do on the training side, uh, equipping the whole nine yards is is where we have gotten to with our budgeting and physical processes. We've uh, as a command, uh, and this was started uh, when General Guthrie was there, uh, and over the past two or three years, it's evolved to where we're at today. So I would share with you on that, that really what's, what's happened in here is that we've given the subordinate units a lot more control over their budget process, their spending process, they own it. And with that said, we're doing a better job uh, getting our soldiers trained. They're not having to wait for orders. Uh, last minute, the funds are there. They uh, are doing a better job planning a year in advance. This past year, uh, we had zero uh, U for zero unfunded requests because we had uh, planned and executed what we had asked for. And we just finished up last week the, the year with 100%, 100% uh, spending. Uh, what we had. So that, that was a big win for us. And then uh, the last thing I have here that I want to talk to you about, and that's where I'll start, and I want to share with you, is operating in the COVID environment and the challenges and, and what we're going uh, to to train. Uh, I would, I know some of you may be wondering about that and, and, and what effect that it's having on us. And I would share with you that although it's a challenge, it's, it's remarkable what the uh, soldiers and civilians have done all the way across use of K-pop to uh, not miss a beat. They've, uh, I, I asked them uh, when it, early on when we started, three things. One, be patient, be flexible, and be adaptable. And they have done that. And across the board and it's, it's different from unit to unit and different parts of the country. Some of us are still at a level where uh, we're not able to have battle assemblies. Our staffing is uh, still reduced and in the reserve centers and uh, we're doing a, a, a lot of teleworking in those locations. But at the same time, everything's getting done. Uh, they just figure it out. If they're if they're not able to have a regular battle assembly, uh, they're getting they're very innovative in what they're doing to conduct training. Uh, one of the first concerns whenever uh, this started back in the spring was what's this going to do to our readiness numbers? What's it going to do to our medical readiness? And I would share with you that we figured out ways to uh, adapt and still get these things done. So we've not we although we might have had some uh, small drops in the readiness, we're, we're still getting that done. Um, training at the CTCs and all, that's been very interesting. We're back doing NTCs, we're back doing JRTCs, uh, but they have to start uh, before they ever get there uh, using their PPP, uh, exercising standards and discipline from the time they leave the house. They've got to start protecting themselves. They can't wait till they get there and then put their mask on and do those types of things. So and it's that's been very uh, learning for us and very adaptive. We're in our second rotations at the, the NTCs, uh, getting ready to start our third. And I can tell you, it's a lot different from the first one, but we learned from the first one, uh, how we transport them there uh, on clean buses uh, till they get there and they've got their PPE on when they get there, they had it on when they were traveling. And so our numbers have gone uh, up uh, quite considerably and we're able to train uh, at the CTC. So uh, school-wise, a lot of our schools continue to conduct because, you know, through the support of the uh, uh, TRADOC side, the schools, they weren't gonna just say, hey, we can't train in the COVID environment. They figured out ways to do it. A lot of virtual uh, was done there. We're still doing basic airborne course at Fort Benning. Uh, they've evolved uh, where they actually have uh, their quarantine set up there. We send the soldiers in earlier. Uh, they go through that and then they get through the training uh, 
uh, without any exposure. We've not had any uh, bad results from that. So I would share that with you because uh, I think that's important because we're not waiting around for COVID to leave. We're going to continue to uh, uh, train and, and prepare, and we're, ju we're just adapting uh, as we move forward. So with that, I'll take just a second break, see if anybody's got any questions about what I've said so far, and in particular, how we're operating in COVID. No questions. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is, this is Colonel Scanlon. So we do have a, a question from the field uh, from Nick Williams. So he says that this year Special Forces recognized it has a culture problem. It's taking steps to fix. And it comes from First Special Forces Command. At the beginning of your talk, you stated KPOC is working to change its culture. Do you think CA has a culture problem? And if yes, what do you see that culture problem as? And uh, what changes in the culture do you think are necessary and why? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, when, when I talk about changing the culture, I'm not talking about it from the standpoint of it being a problem. What, I, what I'm talking about with our culture is, as I indicated about the stovepipes, we tended to be inclusive within our, within our own tribes or our, our branches. And uh, what I'm striving for and asking for when I say a culture change is one that you know we're we're taking all of our strengths within those three branches and with our within our organization uh, working together to empower the other and uh, have stronger results, uh, better support the warfighter combatant command that we're supporting. So I hope that answered your question because I know as you know when a lot of times when you you hear culture, you, you think of negative connotations. But uh, I'm I'm using it from the standpoint of you know getting outside your your uh, your stovepipes and working together. Okay. Okay, I'll move on, Strauss, and if you got another question, you can just roll it into the next one. So I mentioned the equipping thing, and, and I would share with you on our equipping. For any of you that's been in use of KPOC uh, at any time in your careers, you know we've got uh, a lot of equipment and a lot of stuff that collects uh, over time with within the units. And so one thing I'm, I'm I'm really proud of for our organization is that uh, we started what's called Operation Roll Tide. And it's basically a divestiture um, and getting lean and mean with all this excess equipment and the things that we just don't need or don't use anymore uh, that we're filling up our cages. And also, uh, we when we tend to keep things like that, we don't produce the demand signals that are required for the to the Army to replace that equipment or get the, the newer stuff. So it was identified as a, a, a quite a problem. And so to this, to this date, we have uh, divested ourselves of 32,457 pieces of equipment. 32,457 pieces of equipment. That's across uh, the entire use of KPOC, four KCOMs, uh, two POGs, and I mean, they have done an, an outstanding job. We slowed down a little bit because of COVID, just because these things are being laterally transferred or picked up and shipped or whatnot. But, you know, that's really uh, cleaning out a lot of excess stuff that we, gotta, we don't have to maintain anymore. Uh, we also don't have to store anymore and we don't have to keep up with as well. So I wanted to share that with you because it's really, uh, just recently, US, uh, USARC recognized this as well because they realized that it's a problem across USARC. And we had already started this and they used us as an example for that. The other thing I want to share with you too that uh, that's uh, quite interesting, the use of KPOC has been uh, selected 
as the uh, organization in the Army Reserve that's going to be the uh, first one for the fielding of the JLTVs, the Joint Light Tactical Vehicles. So we're looking to start receiving those uh, this physical year, FY21, and uh, the first two that are receiving it's the 353KCOM and Tupac. And this year we're slated to receive 548 JLTVs. And I mean, it's then that's going to be a major undertaking for us logistically because when these when these things come in, they've got to take their home V's that they're turning in, and they've got to take those to the uh, to the ECS wherever the the site is that we're getting the vehicles. They'll be set up there. They'll swap out the uh, commo gear that's in the Humvees and they put them in the JLTVs, get them all set up, and it's a it's a one for one swap, and then they bring that JLTV TV back. So a major undertaking when you think about that many vehicles. And then before it ever takes place, we've got a, all this driver's training that we've got to do, uh, and I hear that JLTV is quite the uh, uh, it's not a Humvee. It's got a lot of uh, electronics, it's got a lot of setups on it, and uh, it's, it's pretty, uh, it, it's a lot more complicated than jumping in that Humvee and taking the chain off the steering wheel and and, and, and moving out. And then the other thing that's uh, also uh, going to be a, a big part of the operation for us, we have to get these Humvees up to 1020 standards, nearly every one of them, because they are going to go somewhere else. So they're not being turned in and, and uh, DXed. So I share that with you on the equipping side as well, because that's something that is going to be a big operation for us in the uh, next two or three physical years as we get uh, quite a few of these JLTVs. So I'll stop there. Is there any, any questions or comments about the equipping? Sir, we've got hey, uh, Jeff, from John Jeff, Chris, Jeff Christockel here. Hey, so what other type of equipment is uh, rolling out to the units to allow them to fully integrate uh, with their partners, uh, like you said, at the GCC and the service component levels? Well, when you talk about equipment in particular, um, you know, we've still got the D-SIGs. Uh, which you're familiar with is a system that a mission command system that we're using. Uh, there's, I've also been informed that that may be in the future that has a, a new system that may be replacing it. But, you know, as far as any types of new systems outside anything Army common, Chris, that's, you know, that's what we're getting right now. Hey, sir, we also have another question from Colonel Stafula. Okay. Hey, John. With the active Army having 10 deployable divisions and 33 brigade combat teams, KPOC has 32 CA battalions and 128 companies. Are we overstructured with too many units to man and equip? Is there a plan to modernize as the AC units modernize and change their structures? Over. Yeah. <clears throat> John, that's a good question. And, uh, you know, and one that we're constantly, I don't want to say struggling with, but we have to think about and, and work with because, you know, the active army's getting equipment uh, a lot quicker than we do in the reserves. And that's one thing that, you know, we continue to work with the proponent on um, and that they're work, you know, they have to work on as well because they determine the, the equipment that we need and they have to stay caught up on it just like we do. One thing I would share with you, you know, you mentioned the number of divisions that the Army has, and one of the, uh, one of the things that I'll have to work with and work on during my tenure is that the, um, with this rearm, you've got eight uh, 
National Guard divisions now that are going to uh, be getting uh, Civil Affairs Battalion support. So, you know, that's just additional uh, Civil Affairs support and that we've got to be providing as well as uh, building those relationships and preparing uh, to train and support over. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Okay, so I'm gonna move on now and talk about Operation Dominant Convergence. And what I would tell you about Operation Dominant Convergence, and here, here's kind of the task and purpose of that. I'll share with you and then you'll, and, and then I think it'll help paint the picture for you. But what oper Operation Dominant Convergence is, is bringing collabor collaborative influencers on target to achieve dominant collective influence and effects in the cognitive domain. Now, what does that mean? If, you know, in, in probably the simplest terms to tell you what that means, think about what use of KPOC units do in the physical environment. What do civil affairs units do in the physical environment? What do the PSYOP units do? What does IO do in the physical environment? So what, what we're looking at here in Operation Dominant Convergence and, and use of KPOC as an organization is that we can bring those same influence and effects that we do in the physical environment, we can also bring those to the cognitive environment uh, in multi-domain operations and uh, in, in the information fight, we can do those same things working together uh, and and we we would be a piece to a, a larger uh, organization and a larger collaborative uh, group of influence influencers cyber mi pao you know whatever you want to bring to this that where we can uh, use our skills to do that so one thing that we're doing uh, general Lucky, before he departed, uh, he saw the possibilities here and uh, he tasked General Guthrie to take the lead on this to, to look and see what's out there. How, how can we do this? How can use of KPOC do this? And how can the Army Reserve do it? It's not just use of KPOC. So that initiative was begun then and then uh, after General Daniels took command, I uh, briefed her on this when what, what we were trying to do, and she said, hey, keep doing what you're doing. So uh, we're uh, moving out on this. We're working in uh, cooperation with AR Cyber, Lieutenant General Fogarty. And right now, you know, we're a lot of uh, planning, a lot of uh, assessment, how are we gonna do this? What's it gonna look like? Uh, we've actually moved on to the next phase, and that's where Operation Dominant Convergence comes in. The next phase is we're actually putting an organization uh, to this, and, and we're going to put together a uh, company that's going to have a combination of PSYOP, IO, CA uh, that come together in teams to allow us to get out and actually experiment, do excursions, and, and put this um, into action to see, you know, to see if, if it works. And the, and the other thing too is if it, it may work, it may fail over here, but we're moving past the concept stage and now we're putting them into action and exercises and in, and in the right place working with other influencers and other branches to uh, uh, you know, try these wares out and and see what the future is for. It will also give us the opportunity for others to see what uh, can be done uh, with using these influencers in the uh, cognitive domain. And so there's great excitement about it. And I would share with you that we're actually, uh, just this week, we're gonna be in our first experiment uh, with a team uh, that's gonna be 
participating in an exercise. And then as we're manning this company, uh, we're looking at uh, exercise opportunities for this because uh, it's at that, it's kind of like building an airplane in flight. You know, a lot of times we hear that and, you know, people think that is a negative connotation, but I would tell you, this is a perfect building an airplane in flight. We're going to make it fly and it's going to go somewhere, but it's an experiment. And, you know, I said, we're creating this company, but what does the structure look like? Well, the structure is really going to look like whatever the mission is, who are you supporting? That's going to be ultimately what determines it. So it's going to be plug and play. Uh, there's a, a lot of other endeavors out there. We're not competing against them. We're not uh, looking to own this. We're just looking to show the opportunities and uh, the ability that you have in the cognitive in domain utilizing civil affairs, psychological operations, and IO, and then you put those three together working as a team or part of a, a larger team uh, in those areas of expertise, say MI, um, the cyber side uh, on the uh, uh, cognitive domain. I mean, it, it's, it's gonna be interesting. You, you've got, uh, you've got non-lethal effects, you've got lethal effects, you've got targeting, you've got, I mean, it's, the, there's, it's limitless what it can do, but I, I'm quite excited about it. We see a lot of excitement out there uh, in other areas because they, you know, they realize what civil affairs does. They realize what PSYOP does. They realize what IO brings to it. Um, and now let's, you know, let's get in the information domain and the cognitive domain and uh, uh, experiment there. So uh, with that, I'll see if anybody's got any questions. Uh, we have a employee online here ready to ask this question live. How are you doing, sir? Um, along with uh, cognitive domain, there seems to be there's going to be a, a great amount of uh, change uh, doctrinally, especially uh, what's going on with the, the new uh, uh, 3-57. Is there any type of transition plan that you have? That's, that's question one. Then also uh, question two, um, as I'm looking at some of the things they're talking about, I'm not saying that there's not going to be SIM, but is SIM going to be transformed? In other words, it's it now falling under this civil knowledge uh, integration piece. And again, what's the way forward for that? Thank you. Hey, Ernest, good to see you, and I uh, hope retirement's going well for you. The um, that's a great question, and and what I would say, you know, as far as the uh, the doctrine piece, you know, that, that would be something I'd really leave to a proponent to say where they're going with how they're doing the doctrine on that. But I would tell you with SIM or, or, or anything else that we have, you know, within our ability there at use of KPOC, there's a place for it in the uh, cognitive domain. Like I said, um, whatever we, whatever they do in the uh, physical domain, they'll be doing in the cognitive domain. I mean, civil reconnaissance, we, they'll be doing civil reconnaissance and, and tracking these things on SIM without ever going out in a Humvee or something. It'll be virtually done. It'll be, uh, you know, the, the same same type, but they may be doing it, um, you know, via uh, the internet, those types of things. It's, it's still gathering information, um, collecting information, and doing the so what about that information, and then how does it play into what they're doing on the cyber side uh, with whatever that operation is that we're working in the cognitive domain. Thank you very much, sir. And, and just a final thing on that. And the, th the challenge for all of us is, is that, you know, this, this is moving so fast. Uh, we all have to uh, be flexible and adaptable to move with it because it's not waiting on us. We've got to catch up with it. So, you know, that goes for, for those of us that are out here trying to uh, uh, provide operators for it, as well as the doctrine and all too. So, you know, there's a lot of interesting things that'll have to happen. The authorities, those are things that have to be considered. Um, but there's a lot of energy out there and there's a, a lot of people involved in it right now. And uh, we're, get, we're getting there. 
All right, sir, we got some other people that are teed up to ask questions live. Uh, okay. Matt Karenbauer, go ahead, sir. If you, you should be able to uh, mute yourself or turn on your video to ask the general question. Good afternoon, sir. I'm Matt Karenbauer from uh, the Combat and Garrison and uh, Technical Support Office under the uh, under ASD Solik. Uh, my question is regarding to your uh, one of your first statements that communications capabilities uh, remains a, a significant problem set across the force. Um, and having just come off the line uh, not too long ago, um, beyond line of sight communications platforms are really just limited to SATCOM. Um, on your discussion of fielding equipment to the force, are there any discussions of um, providing additional communications equipment that would actually be useful uh, against uh, you know, near peer adversaries in a competition environment? Over. Yeah, I appreciate the question. You know, I, I would have to tell you, when I talk about challenges with our communications equipment and proficiency, I'm not so much talking about um, equipping, getting the equipment, where, where I'm concerned is our proficiency at training and using that equipment. Uh, in a battle assembly weekend, uh, setting up a D-SIGS is, is uh, nearly impossible. Uh, so uh, also with our 20, 25 uniforms, we've got, when, when you look at the numbers of the 25 series that we have, we've got a lot of them, but the problem is we don't have them in the right place. So we're also having to look at uh, how do we, do we need to make some changes in our, in our MTO, especially at the battalion level to get the 25s where we're at? Because they're the subject matter experts um, that, that need to be at the battalions to support them and train on that proficiency. So uh, I wouldn't, I'm not so concerned about the equipment as I am getting our soldiers to, uh, to train and become proficient on what they have. All right, sir, we have uh, uh, Veronica next. Ma'am, go ahead and uh, ask your question. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. Hey, sir. Hey, sir. Uh, good afternoon. This is Colonel Veronica oswald Rucky. I am the War College Director of Women, Peace, and Security Studies. Um, in the work that I actually started off as the Army lead uh, for Women, Peace, and Security under PKSOI, and uh, in transition to the War College, integrating the Women, Peace, and Security uh, concepts. Um, we have an act, we have a strategy, a Women, Peace, and Security strategy, and now we have a DOD implementation plan and three other interagency implementation plans, aid, state, and homeland security, that focuses on the meaningful participation of women and applying the gender perspective operationally downrange, which includes benefits all genders, um, that it that actually builds partnership capacity um, and brings in new partners and specifically looks at specifically looks at 50 percent of the population on the ground we haven't been engaging as key stakeholders and that's women and girls and then looking at the impact that that has uh, that that conflict has on women and girls how it disproportionately affects them differently than it disproportionately affects other genders. Um, I was just, I, my question was, is the um, operation, the operation dominant convergence um, task force or team that you're putting together, would that be one that would look at addressing how to, um, to get at those types of concepts over? Hey, that's a good question. And I would, I would say yes, that it could, because if we're doing a good job in our civil affairs operations, we're not just looking at half the population, we're looking at all the population. And I can tell you from my experience um, being deployed, uh, working women's issues and, and that type of thing was very important to our civil affairs operations when we were downrange. Uh, and I, in two, 2009, was a, when I was a battalion commander in Iraq, I had uh, two great uh, female officers who focused in on women's issues. And I mean, that, that was one of the highlights of some of the, of, of the work that we did in Iraq. And it was recognized by the, the, um, the embassy as well. So my point being, that's very important. And I mean, it's, you've just got to, you know, 
you, you've got to utilize the full spectrum of your civil affairs abilities, or if it's PSYOP or I.O., and, that, and that's part of it, because you make a good point about it being 50% of the population and it being ignored. Well, we don't need to ignore 50% of the population. You can have influence and effects um, when you consider what the, that, that aspect of it, just like you can any other aspect. Because, you know, I, I would tell you, it, at that time, it was very important to engage the female population because they had a lot of, a lot of influence more than people gave them credit for on the men in the in the uh, theaters. So uh, it is very important. So I, I appreciate you asking that question because if we are going somewhere and not considering that in our uh, operations as civil affairs operators, we're missing out on a, a opportunity as well as uh, not doing our uh, not doing our jobs to the fullest uh, ability that we can. Did, did did that answer your question? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, it, it we definitely we're looking at moving from seeing women as victims, um, and also looking at the key leader engagement that may be more informal than formal, and how we think of it. And so, creating something new downrange and that opportunity um, to bring them on to bring them on, and also for the long term effect that, that can also bring. Uh, but looking at key leader engagements with women also as meaningful participants, but then also as part of sustained society, they found that when they are at the table um, during the agreement that there's an increased chance of the agreement occurring it lasts longer because they advocate for the very issues that sustain a society over. Right. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not just, um, it's not just being, uh, recognize them and, and, you know, as might be a victim or something. But the other thing is very important and that I've seen great success in is, you know, uh, in uh, small business and, and getting them into those types of things too. So, uh, and I mean, there's a there's great opportunity there. And I would tell you, you know, two, two deployments to Iraq uh, and the women's uh, engagements that we did, I mean, they were just, it, it was unreal, and it was it was one of the things that really uh, supported the uh, BCT and the divisions on the two different deployments that I worked for. Um, I mean, they saw results for influence and effects by doing that. Yes, sir, the next question is from uh, Erica Castor. She asked, has the Operation Dominic Convergence in its conceptual phase considered ways to further coordinate with interagency partners that are trying to influence the same space? Will that be part of the current experimental phase or in the future? Thank you. That's a good question. Right now, um, as we're, you know, this thing is just starting out, and I'd say that the end, the end result or where it goes is, is really endless on who, who could participate. But right now we're uh, working uh, within the uh, Army aspect of it to get it initiated and moving forward, but no, I, if this, you know, this, this inf information dominance and, and dominant convergence is, uh, there's no limit. If you think about a, uh, an IO working group on the joint level and a COCOM level where you've got all those pieces there, this same thing in the cognitive field could, could exist. So, uh, but right now we're just, we're getting our, feet wet with it, working uh, within the Army. Over. All right, sir. Next question is with uh, Brian McNeil. Sir, you should be able to unmute yourself and ask the general a question. He might be having issues. I'll ask the question, sir. So, what ideas do you have to increase? Oh, Brian, are you there? Okay. Sir, what ideas do you have to increase morale and esprit de corps among past and present civil affairs personnel, specifically relative to the branch and use of K-pop? Do you plan any initiatives to bolster dedication and loyalty to the branch in an effort to improve current and future support for CA and use of K-pop? 
That's a good question. You know, one of the things that is in my command philosophy and also, um, you know, I put out early on is that pride, pride. And I want every soldier to be proud of themselves, proud of their units, and proud of the organization, uh, and proud of the Army and the nation that they serve. So, you know, that's one of the things that I, every chance I get to talk to troops, I talk about the pride thing, because I, you know, they ought to be proud of, of what they're doing in service in their country. And then the same thing is uh, after they leave the service and all, they should, you know, think back on that experience with pride and that they were a part of something bigger and, and carry that with them. You know, we're all on this, uh, uh, all of us that are on this call today and, and taking part in the CA Association, you know, we, we continue to do that because uh, you, uh, you care and you are proud of the service that you had when you served and, and you continue to be proud of, of uh, that service and being a part of the CA Association. That just carries it on. So uh, that's, that's what I would share with you. And that's what I do. Like I said, when I'm out with the soldiers, I, I want them to be proud of that. And I, want, and, and I talk to them about that so that, you know, they have the opportunity to reflect on it. All right, sir. So, Anthony, I'm not sure if you can speak, but uh, you, you should be able to unmute yourself and ask your question. Okay, so you might have a microphone. Uh, sir, here's a question from Anthony. The War for Talent was coined 23 years ago in 1997. The NDS of 2018 and the people, Army People Strategy 2019 have recently emphasized the strategic value requirement to leverage talent management. How is civil affairs and specifically use of KPOC posturing for success in the war on talent? Okay. Um, you know, that's a good question because when, when you talk about talent management, what's really important to us is uh, as leaders and on down the, the chain of command is that we, we have a responsibility uh, to recognize talent and to mentor and grow that talent from an early uh, start. You know, when we get our soldiers in, we need to recognize that and we need to, to uh, mentor them and, and lead them because at, what we're doing is building our organization and that's our future leaders. So it doesn't start when they become majors or lieutenant colonels or sergeant first class or Master Sergeant, it starts early on and, and recognizes that. And I can tell you, it's, it's very important because now where our shortages are with our mid-grade officers and our um, uh, mid-grade NCOs, you know, there's a, a gap there for talent. So it's all the more important that we're recognizing our talent and that we're managing it as well. Hey, with that said, I don't want to uh, get too far down the road without giving some time to talk about the uh, 38 golf, uh, because that's another uh, kind of ties, allows me to segue into talent management and bringing uh, new talent and expertise in. So uh, as I said earlier, this 38 golf, for those of you that have been around a while, you, you, you know what the 38 golf is. And uh, in the past, we've had a lot of, uh, 38 golf positions in our uh, ranks, in our units, but we didn't have those filled. So I would tell you now that we've really uh, reached a point where I think it's gonna, that's gonna change. Uh, we're going to start seeing our 38 golfs uh, filled. There's a couple of things that are going on there that are making this happen. Number one, uh, the proponent uh, has worked real hard uh, and, uh, consult with uh, use of KPOC and we're now having uh, direct commissioning for our 38 golfs. Uh, we're also about to have an MTO change which is going to reduce the number of our 38 golfs. Uh, let me see where those numbers are. Uh, that's going to reduce the number of the 38 golfs to a manageable number that I think uh, over time, uh, we're going to start with this, uh, uh, with the 
uh, direct commission in this past board, and Scott can probably tell us when he comes on, but they just had a board last week and it probably had uh, 40 or more uh, applicants on that board. So uh, that's really exciting. So I'll let him tell more about the 38G and I'm sure you got some questions, uh, but I'm gonna turn it over to Scott and Jesse and let him fill you in on 38Gs and, and build some questions too. Scott. Well, thank you, sir, appreciate it. Appreciate the opportunity to speak to everybody uh, this afternoon. Um, so I'm gonna kind of take you on a little bit of a historical perspective, uh, 38 Golf, and uh, kind of get into uh, what we're doing and what we have planned for the future. Um, so the 38 Golf program, the military governance uh, specialist um, area of concentration program, um, it began to be explored back in um, 2013 timeframe. And it was, um, you know, respond to critical uh, civil uh, capability gaps um, in ungoverned and um, undergoverned uh, spaces where local authorities and the interagencies, they couldn't, uh, couldn't engage just because of the, uh, the situation. And during the analysis, about 18 skill identifiers were, uh, were decided on in the sectors of governance, rule of law, uh, economics, and public and uh, social services. Um, once again, the Special Operations Center of Excellence is the proponent for this, so they worked on the development piece. Um, but all, all assigned positions, 38 Golf, are, are located um, in use of KPOC. So why, why do this? Um, because um, it's part of, they relate to the Geneva and Hague Convention and uh, under Title X responsibilities. Um, and it's to identify and address like really critical civil uh, vulnerabilities uh, that exist in these undergoverned and ungoverned spaces. And it's also in tradition of what happened in World War II as well. Um, when you had a whole nation mobilized with a whole uh, spectrum of talent, um, the force is much smaller now, um, but we still need those capabilities, uh, I believe, uh, just as much as we needed them then, we need them now. Um, so, um, the objectives of the, back in 2013, the objective of the pro, uh, program was to kind of um, revitalize what was referring to as military governance capabilities. Um, and the idea of supporting civil uh, administration and transitional military authority, provide a reach back capability and collaborate with the uh, civil experts and also to prevent and shape the, um, the security, uh, theater security cooperation. So, the 18 skill identifiers um, relate to uh, industry and production, energy, emergency management, finance, commerce, trade, transportation, technology, uh, agriculture and business, and then under governance, civil administration, laws, policies, uh, natural resources, uh, rule of laws, more judicial systems, corrections, and then public and social services with education, cultural heritage, and um, archivists. So all that took place in 2013, 2015, I believe is the date, uh, the year they started boarding um, TPU uh, officers um, for, uh, for 38 golf positions. As of August of last year, um, there was uh, 350th KCOM had seven qualified 38 golfs, Three, 351 had eight, um, 352 had about um, eight well as well, and 353 had 10 positions. But that's a total of about, out of all those positions, there were about, uh, you know, 550 positions. That's all the people um, that were inside the command. There were about 147 that were outside of the command. And that's where, um, when I was given this task, that's where I started engaging upon was the people outside of the command and kind of getting their perspective. Um, and after conversations, um, what I found out, there's just a general lack of awareness. Um, and also those awarded 38 Gulf that were outside the command, they're like, no one that, you know, I didn't really have anyone reach out to me or whatever their reason was. It's like nothing has taken place. All I did was get a notification that I got qualified. So it was a lack of awareness. Um, there was a lack of demand. Uh, also a lack of supply. And I jokingly say it's a business startup and it's the worst of all worlds with no supply and no demand. So the strategy was established of, okay, we can't recruit against that. So if we've got to fill out all these billets, we first must describe and demonstrate these capabilities. 
you know, match the capabilities to force requirements specifically, and then recruit against it. And it's right now I see it as a five step process um, in this effort, expanded from three to about five. So we identify what's, what's been happening lately, you know, or I'd say in 2020, we're leaning into the problem by identifying the force requirement, identifying the gaps uh, to meet those requirements. And crucially, we're aligning 38 Gulf networks um, to, to these gaps to meet these requirements, employ the capabilities, and then share the knowledge and the network gain and the networks that were gained with the rest of the force, and that's that's really crucial. I'm gonna I'm gonna hit on that uh, shortly. The first um, skill identifier um, we approached um, happened to be Six Victor, the Heritage and Preservation um, skill identifier. Um, and I'm sure there's conversations out there. It's like why of all skill identifiers? Uh, well, one um, because I'm a Six Victor myself, and it's also one of the the only one that's legally mandated um, because of the 1954 Hague Convention. It's required that we have uh, this capability inside the force. Um, and I knew there was a massive gap there, um, and the discussions have been taking place for years that this gap needed to be filled. So I had my network, I saw the, the capability gap, and I'm like, this is the easy way of doing it. And I knew, our counterpart, and I know Corey Wagner is on, on, this, um, on this meeting here, um, retired civil affairs officer. And um, really, my, I wanna say right now, just what, a, what an outstanding partner the Smithsonian is. And these type of civilian institutions are our are, are dream, are our answer to a lot of our problems. Because I know it's not just the Smithsonian, there's other groups we're looking into, and Major Dale Cayunga is working with me and Dale's really leading the way on a lot of issues. But, you know, looking at, you know, you look at 3-57 and it explains um, the, uh, the 2019 version, explains the skill identifiers. And I'm going to use the example of Six Victor, and then I'll, I'll lead you out to the other skill identifiers. And so um, Six Victors are to assist, advise, reestablish contact administration with uh, management of activities relating to cultural heritage nationally, regionally, provincial levels, provide technical expertise, and then conduct uh, research and engagement. Now, people might think that, oh, you're just drilling with direct, culture, direct uh, directly with cultural property, but it actually, to me, it relates to the intangible elements of social cohesion. It's all, I would say, in, in some ways, it's the secret sauce. Of, of why communities are together and why they're being torn apart. And a lot of times our, our, our competitors are using cultural heritage to their advantage and we have seen that in recent conflicts. So knowing this, we recruited against this, um, the idea of what, this, uh, what the, the doctrine says. So we have brought in, um, in the process of the scrolling process is bringing in people with PhDs and masters in education and cultural heritage. Uh, you know, a lot of them have 10 plus years of experience. Um, they have worked at an executive level. Um, they have access to a lot of technology and information systems to describe the human terrain. All right, so these candidates come from museums, the State Department, FBI, Department of Interior, National Park Service. They work in cultural property law. They also work in the, uh, the art market, work at universities and geospatial technologies, NGOs and international organizations. So it's a pretty vast group. Um, not, not what you think of just curators. Um, they, when we went and started uh, did the first board um, and sitting with proponents, it, the, the surprise was that these weren't just plain uh, museum, um, you know, people you expect to see in a museum. They're actually innovators of their field and doing some very interesting stuff. So what capabilities, capabilities can they do? You know, the Hague Convention advised geographical combatant commanders on their area responsibilities because they own the problem of cultural heritage and also understanding their environment. Having in-depth knowledge of places that we are going to deploy to, and they know people in those areas. And then along with the conservation, preservation, and restoration expertise they bring, and also issues of data analytics and issues relating to illicit trafficking um, in uh, criminal networks. 
Now, the idea is converting a skill identifier into multi-domain operations, because we have to think about it, the idea, the phases of compete, uh, penetrate, uh, uh, dis, uh, integrate, exploit, and return to competition. We speak in those terms. We do not speak skill identifier only. And uh, to the point of how do we amplify what we're doing is we, we knew that there were certain groups that needed our expertise. First, OSD policy, because they own the 1954 Hague Convention. So we're working with them to set up policy um, and provide expertise in that area. And it has a big effect. And it also has pulled us into a conversations on all the other skill identifiers and also relating to what 38 Alphas and Bravos do and our PSYOP and information operations do. It expands our network and expands our reach. The second um, line of effort is developing cultural property training to operational units. But how does it apply to them? Not that they're gonna be heritage experts, it's we look at their lines of effort and what they're doing on missions. And then we say, all right, we're gonna draw a direct line on how cultural heritage protection actually advances your mission. Doesn't matter if it's cultural heritage related, but it will provide understanding for civil reconnaissance in depth beyond what's usually provided. Um, we provided training to uh, a company that deployed for a Southcom mission um, just recently. They're they're just starting their deployment now, and I would I would argue that the, the people we brought in for the training was some of the top training that that company has received in a long time. Also, provide reachback capability so that unit has deployed. We're sitting there um, uh, with information for it when they need it, and also to provide information for uh, geospatial information about uh, data layers that they can employ to provide common operational uh, picture to the supported command. The, four, uh, the fourth LOE uh, relates to uh, working with the Defense Intelligence Agency related to no strike list. So in these areas, we, we reach out pretty vast and touching across different agencies, uh, USAID, that, um, you know, uh, the different uh, COCOMs, the different agencies, um, Army Geospatial Center, the proponents, uh, international um, uh, partners, uh, different militaries. We're working with the British, Canadian, French, and Dutch. And we automatically, this theme of expanding our network and the kind of that collaborative and that collective influence, that's what we're reaching for. And we have the training that we've uh, already initiated with the 38 Gulf uh, Six Victors. The virtual phase has already kicked off and we're doing that once a week with the Smithsonian. Um, but it's virtual, and then next spring we'll be meeting together um, to do it face-to-face, -face, hopefully. So scaling up and scaling out, expanding that influence and what we've gained on so far. So the next uh, um, skill identifiers that are up um, for training being set up in uh, partnerships with KPOC and also uh, with Proponent relate to energy, commerce and trade, water and sanitation, agriculture, and then, of course, we're doing heritage, and then we got archivists. So think about how that affects your worlds and what you can do with these people, real experts, and how when you start looking across the 18 skill identifiers, they really start opening things wide. And our main objective is to support our alphas and bravos, our PSYOP soldiers, and our information uh, operations soldiers, and how they can improve. We don't want, we don't, we don't want to do anything in a silo. Even on the cultural heritage, we're always talking terms operational, always talking operational. And what we, can we do for the, uh, the units and organizations that we support? We've got a lot of great feedback coming from uh, the civilian sector. Uh, they are definitely leaning our way. Um, and you know, the conversation, uh, the question was saying, okay, what can we do to improve speed of core and actually uh, you know, that was posed to the, uh, the CG, is that we're working to kind of expand our capabilities and knowing what we all know and how we can benefit the future force and how a program like 38 Gulfs working with Alphas and Bravos and PSYOP and information operations, how can we improve so the next time that our nation calls, we are prepared. And we can all look each other in the eye and say, we are ready for this. And so the program is to support that. As General Coggin mentioned, that um, FTU Junior is going to scale us down to around 216 38 Gulfs. We are specifically recruiting Gulfs into units, not just to have them like kind of before the MILPERS allowed uh, 
people to hang out, officers to hang out in the IRR. Now the MILPR requires you to transfer to use of KPOC, which is a good thing. We're also recruiting beyond the, you know, 2021. We're looking a couple years out because we have to. Um, our, the 38 Gulfs are not exactly in their 20s. They, are, they have a little bit of age on them, uh, experience and wisdom. So we're, we're looking to see, to build the future 38 Gulfs as well. Currently, we have about 50 38 Gulfs assigned inside the command. 30 candidates are in the scrolling process. The next board that meets in a couple weeks will have 40 candidates um, are lined up. 50 candidates are estimated for the following board, and we have about 20 TPU transfers pending. That puts us around the 190 mark. We're quickly getting there. But the thing is that once we get these people, you know, we only have them for a couple years and then and they're gone. So it's always a recruiting effort. Um, but once again, the, the main piece is that how can we support you? What can we do? And it's a really exciting time. I'm happy to be part of this. I know Major Kiunga as well. And wait till you see these people. The 38 Gulfs that are coming in are outstanding talent. And um, I'm a proud to be part of it. Uh, and I can take any questions. Hey, Scott. This is uh, Strauss. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay, so a two-part question for you. The first comes from retired Colonel Ann Campbell, former Peace Corps volunteer in Jamaica. Have you considered recruiting returning Peace Corps volunteers for the 38 Gulf positions? And to follow on to that into career progression, General Isaac Johnson is asking about uh, progression for potential command at company, battalion, or brigade level. Are 38 Gulfs qualified to compete for 38 Alpha commands and positions? Okay, the first answer is yes. All right, so I'll put that one off to the side. Uh, the second answer, um, you know, the discussions that have taken place for a while. Right now, the, especially with the direct appointment personnel, they're coming in as 38 Gulfs. And the, the current, and, and Sir uh, uh, General Coggin, correct me if I overstep my bounds, please. Uh, they, they will not be in command. They're due to serve as staff as officers. Now, I myself am a 38 Gulf, but I'm also a 38 Alpha. So 38 Alphas, um, if you have another MOS, you can bounce back and forth and, and take command at, uh, in, in whatever uh, unit you get selected for to do command it. The 38 Gulf program is designed to be a staff and advisor position. Um, so those, the TPU, they can go in command as, as, they, as their career moves on. But those that are coming strictly in as 38 Gulfs, um, my understanding is they will remain 38 Gulfs. But the, the idea is that you can transfer back and forth. I automatically switched my 38 Gulf to the top level of my primary MOS, my AOC. But I also did that while serving as a battalion commander. So you can serve in command as a 38 Gulf, but you must have the original MOS. And sir, correct me if I was wrong on any of that. No correction. <laughs> Thank you, sir. <laughs> All right, Scott, we've got some more questions for you. Uh, so from Tim, and I don't have a last name, we're currently competing below the level of armed conflict. We're in competition. Training is critical, if not everything, when we're not performing a mission. How are 38 Gulfs involved in winning or compete in the competition phase of, as we go beyond the training, but not quite conflict? Okay, excellent question. So um, the idea of what 38 Gulfs can bring, I wanna answer, I, I wanna kind of come from that approach. So when we have discussions about the energy sector, which is another favorite topic of mine, we have candidates that are working downtown Houston, Dallas-Fort Worth, all right, working for large companies, energy companies that, um, and then we have those that are coming into the force that are in the scrolling process. They fight the competition phase five days a week at a very high level, and they're, they're directly competing with our adversaries. And the idea, and I'm not going to quite answer your question fully, but it's like, how do we bring that capability and that information into our civil reconnaissance and understanding? Um, the idea that also the training scenarios for our civil affairs soldiers and PSYOPs is the idea is more information about when they go off and do a either individual training or collective training that they can bring additional context that, you know, they, well, we'll propose a project or we'll have a KOE, have this discussion, or we're going to say we're working on interagency issues. 
And those 38 Gulfs that really know the area that do work internationally can say, well, that's true, that can happen this way, but it also can happen. There's all these other considerations that you need to be aware of. Um, right now, we're developing those personnel on the aspect of uh, bringing them into the force. We want to get them out into the training environment as quickly as possible to improve training readiness. Big, big piece to employ 38 Gulfs. It's not an ivory tower thing. It's we got to get them out there into the forest as soon as possible. All right, and then uh, from Major Brian Hancock, 351 SIM Chief. We just had the IRT mission to Unalaska to uh, look with a mix of 38 Gulfs across the functional specialty team along with the SIM element. And a great mission and recognized by DOD for what they accomplished. Is there any, are there any other training opportunities for 38 Gulfs across the commands to look at some of the real world infrastructure, real world issues and concerns to conduct professional development uh, and show the force, the greater DOD, DOD force in your agency, what we are capable of? Right, so each, each civilian partnership that we're working on on those sectors um, that I mentioned on the skill identifiers is to do exactly that to do exactly that. Like the, the Smithsonian training called AMOT, the Army Monuments Officer Training Program, that looks at specific issues that are facing operational units. Uh, and the same thing is for all the other skill identifiers is to look into those. And the opportunities are available and you can, you can look me up on Global, um, uh, you know, just put into Jesse and I think there's a Lance Corporal in the Marine Corps that might, name might come up as well. But, you know, reach out to me and we'll connect you in and we're, we're trying to develop that training and then push it down. How can we push it down to units? We've done that already with the six victors and we have a couple units. One, um, I think it's actually the 49th maybe that we're going to provide a training later on this month. And not only with that, with that training, especially with the cultural heritage training, that network that we bring. So we're actually going to provide trainers that are in the AOR that are going to be communicating with those soldiers. And one of my colleague from Texas Tech is, is on this, and she, she told me something interesting yesterday. She said at, at a conference, someone said, well, what resources do you bring? What information can I find, the expertise you bring? It's like what the response was, what I bring is my network. So we can connect in that training scenarios or preparing. We can bring a network of direct information to areas where people are going to deploy or possibly deploy, or if it's a, you know, a KCOM, what areas are they assigned to? Uh, so we're, we want to work directly with the KCOMs and, and also proponent on exactly the training that can be delivered from the 38 Gulfs. And, 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 to the, and also one thing is what the big so what General Coggin mentioned, the big so what is what we're also really going for it here is if you have a condition and you have an objective, we want to get very specific on the gaps between that so we can elevate civil affairs tactically, operational, and strategically up. And the 38 Gulfs, um, the networks they have, the information they have, they can help do that. Yeah, and I would just add to what Colonel DeJesse said, you know, this is really exciting times for the 38 Gulf because, you know, as I mentioned, the proponent uh, has, has worked to uh, change the accessions of it to a direct commission. So that the great excitement there. And then you couple that with the AMOT uh, kickoff with uh, the Smithsonian a year ago this month. Uh, that raised the excitement. And uh, it also was informative and uh, getting the word out there. And, uh, you wouldn't believe how many, and I know Scott probably gets them too, uh, LinkedIn uh, and Facebook messages about, the 38G, it's it's really peaked. And then with our the right sizing, when this FD Junior comes out, uh, I think it's, uh, you know, it's uh, this thing uh, for the 38 uh, Golf, it's, it's finally moving forward because we've, we've got the ability to get them into the force. We're now moving forward with the ability to train them. And then uh, they're getting out there and doing missions, uh, utilizing the uh, special uh, expertise that they bring with them. So exciting times. Well, General Coggin, so we've got a couple of questions that have been teed up for a while. Uh, General Zubek from uh, the Combined Forces of Korea has a question. 
Uh, sir, can you unmute your mic and the floor is yours. Hey, Chris. Hey, good morning, Jeff. It's great to see everybody online. Um, so we just completed a training event here. Uh, they're semi-annual training events. Uh, they used to have names. Now they have kind of innocuous names. But um, it was my first opportunity in the new job to uh, see it from the other side. So it leads to the following question. Um, from the perspective of use of KPOC, what can the COCOMs and the core level staff primary officers do to better stimulate KPOC unit training? Yeah, you know, that's a good question. I think, Chris, and, and you, you probably are experiencing that from both sides. Part of it's just the uh, coordination, synchronization, and the cooperation that goes on from start to finish. Um, how engaged are the units? How engaged is the COCOM um, in incorporating them in and they get incorporated into the mission? Because, you know, if it's a clear, clear path from the beginning, then they're part of the team. Uh, when they get there and part of your team, and that facilitates success as well as the uh, a training experience that they come away with. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, we'll get to hear tomorrow from Major Eric Westfall. He was one of the uh, individuals who came over and trained with us uh, last month. So uh, we'll we'll try to execute everything you just described. Thanks. One more question from uh, Lieutenant Colonel Roger Garcia at the 9th Mission Support Command in Hawaii. Are there any plans to leverage Task Force Oceana within USAR PAC to integrate uh, some sort of information task force or group as a proof of concept? Strauss, can you repeat that again? I, I caught part of it, but... Uh, yes, sir. From Lieutenant Colonel Roger Garcia at the 9th MSC, are there any plans to leverage Task Force Oceana within USARPAC to integrate a type of information task force or dominant convergence unit as a proof of concept? Well, I'm, I'm not at my level and what we're doing at the headquarters there with our uh, op dominant convergence. I'm not tracking anything that we're, we're doing in, in concert with you right now. It doesn't mean it might not be in the future, but uh, part of that effort, we're not, uh, we don't have anything planned with you. Over. Now, I, I would, let me back up now. I would say uh, General Johnson, if he's still on the call, y'all may be doing something in that operation because that's your AO. Um, but as far as the uh, you know, our, our team of influencers under Operation Dominant Convergence, no. I, General Johnson, have you got anything to add to that? Y'all, because y'all may be doing something with them now from, from a CA standpoint. And then uh, Colonel Mann, he's probably not on this call, but uh, Seven Pog, they may be doing something in support of it too, but not in concert with y'all. Yes, sir, it looks like uh, Colonel Johnson or General Johnson said yes, they're planning for an FY21 22 planning cycle. Okay. Good. So that sounds like there may be opportunity there for uh, some more excursions on the uh, dominant convergence. Over. Okay. And then uh, from Dan Still, he's interested in hearing what your vision is on how. The Civil Affairs Commands and Brigades will support Geographical Combatant Commands and Army Service Component Commands at their strategic and operational level in multi-domain operations and great power competition. And wondering if you have a couple of examples from any recent unit exercises at that level to show how the, the support to the operational level is progressing. Over. Yeah. Hey, that's a great question because really uh, what you're asking there is, is, is really summarizing what I've been talking about with Operation Dominant Convergence and getting outside of our stovepipes, bringing in our uh, full force of what we do there uh, in support of the 
a warfighter that we're supporting. So, and really it could, it, you may, you may already be doing it and you don't know it. You're just, you know, the, the PSYOP, the CA, the IO, they're all communicating and working together. In a sense, you're, you're talking about uh, your uh, working groups. You know, you, your working groups are a good example of that, but are you carrying it over into the cognitive domain um, with the, the cyber and so forth? So uh, what, what we're talking about here is getting these teams together and in, in, in a more uh, deliberate manner uh, moving forward and 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 working uh, as a team instead of in you know in separate entities working your your area your CA area your PSYOP area your cyber area your IO area but now working together I would tell you that in our uh, CPX foxtrots that uh, we've been doing uh, this more or less uh, breaking down the uh, walls between the uh, our branches and the CPXs and having them work together and and they really have realized uh, the opportunity and how it empowers what they're doing I would share with you we we only had one of our three CPXs this year due to COVID but I was in the AARs with the units after it was over and had a PSYOP captain stand up and and he, he looked around, he said, you know, this was really great this time. I never worked with those guys like that. And he was talking about the civil affairs. You know, they went and did their thing and, and, and the others went and did their thing in the past, but now they're working together. And, uh, you know, it's just like matches and gasoline. You may not start a fire with one or the other, but if you put them together, it's gonna be, it's gonna be pretty, pretty big. And so uh, that's one reason I'm excited about it because I've seen what we can do with this um, and seen a lot of uh, discussion about it, but now we're moving forward with it. So I think you'll see more uh, the Pacific Defender, uh, General Johnson mentioned uh, theirs. I think they're gonna have the uh, uh, information brigade, uh, that, that type of concept. You know, we're, the Defender Europe in 20 was headed to have the uh, TIC, Theater Information Command, when COVID came along and that uh, ended up getting canceled, but that was gonna be a great opportunity to, to have an excursion in one of these uh, information type organizations. So I, I think you're gonna see more of it uh, coming in the future because there's a lot of, uh, you know, this has got the highest emphasis at the highest levels right now. And uh, there's a lot of buzz going on right now to get out there and experiment. Over. All righty, sir. Uh, so we had, do have uh, five more questions teed up. Uh, they're all 38 golf related. Do you want to pump those over to Colonel Jesse? If I, one of us will answer them. We might tag team them. Go ahead. All righty, sir. Uh, so I'll start at the oldest one. So how can we work with the six victors to help integrate their available experience and expertise into the common CA and geographical combatant command systems. I'll let Scott have that one. I, I, the, the way is discussing it always in terms of population re resource control and support to civil administration. Um, you, you'd be surprised. I mean, when we think about cultural heritage and how it just ties into our every day, I, I, I challenge you to make it through your day without getting hit in the face with cultural heritage and how it's part of the political spectrum, how it's part of rule of law. So anything, the, the way it, you shouldn't necessarily be talking about it strictly once again about the skill identifier. Think about what you wanna understand about your space. What are the drivers? If you're doing an investigation about uh, an analysis of the operating environment, what are the drivers of conflict? And how sometimes our competitors are, are, are creating problems and, and, and the idea of what the societies are having to deal with. I, I would always put it straight in line with civil affairs tasks, everything. And, and, that, and that's with all the skill identifiers, always tie them directly in and let them, let the experts 
describe to you how they can make your world a bit easier and give you that additional information to make quality decisions and advise the, your supporting units. Thank you. Uh, from Raymond, I'm gonna butcher the last name, I apologize, LaRoe, would you consider qualified 38 Bravos for direct appointments for 38 Golf or would they have to go to the IRR to apply? So the discussions um, that has been engaged and we've had this conversation with proponent and, and when 38 Golf first came around, uh, I know there was a big pushback with the idea of like, you know, uh, what about the NCOs, like, you know, soldiers and stuff. And I know that the, the 38 Bravos that are inside our force are, you know, have advanced degrees and they work at senior positions. They just like being an NCO, being a soldier um, in the reserves. The direct appointment prospect process has been described to us as not to circumvent any direct commission process. So you must, to apply, you must complete your contract, exit the force, and then apply for direct appointment. That is, that came down, proponent informed us, that came down from senior army leadership. Uh, from the secretary that that's the process to follow. Um, but we do value, and, and also the thing is, it's not a zero sum game. We, we, we don't wanna draw from our force, like get rid of Bravos and Alphas to make more 38 gulps. We don't wanna do that. I, I would argue against that. And, and because we want to increase the capability of the force. Um, and if you have the expertise, you know, what you can do is line up with 38 Gulfs and other Alphas and Bravos and how we can collectively come together and harness that talent together is so important. Um, but we know that our, our civil affairs soldiers are some really talented people. Um, it's just a, it's a rank thing because you go walk into a room of senior officials, they wanna see a rank. And, uh, and it's the formulation for how they appoint people is basically how many years you've been in the career field and how many advanced degrees you have. It's just that simple. Well, thank you. And then a uh, question from Jace Blunt. Uh, when is the new milper going to be released about the 38 golf boards and why should 38 alphas apply to be a 38 golf if they are qualified to do so? Well, the, the milper should, should have already been released. Um, Proponent owns that. So hopefully if it's not out now, it, it will be out shortly. Um, and that's a personal career decision on you know, I, I knew that 38 Golf was a calling for me because I was kind of involved in some of the presentations early on back in 2014 when they were discussing this program. And of course, that's where my additional skill identifier moved into anyway. So you have to make that decision. But, um, you know, the value you bring, uh, Alphas and Bravos bring in their positions. I mean, it's, it doesn't change who you are. You know, you can, you can you know, move to a different part of KPOC and get, get involved in different planning teams. But um, it's just a personal decision. Even as an alpha, I was still focused on cultural heritage. So it didn't really matter. It just now they, you know, they slapped a label on me and I said, sure, this is awesome. I love it. That, that doesn't have anything to do with that PhD in that too, does it, Scott? No, uh, just the master's degree for me. Oh, and I wanted to bring up one point. The, uh, the uh, uh, Dale reminded me that we have, um, actually we have three peacekeep, peacekeepers, um, um, Peace Corps alum in the 38 Gulf program now, so. But I would, I would never go for a PhD, sir. It's just, I can't read that well. All right, thank you, uh, Scott. General Coggin, we are clear of questions. And uh, if there's anything else you'd like to discuss or bring up, um, we may generate some more questions. Thank you. Well, I think I, I hit the high points that I, I wanted to uh, speak of. Um, and, and really what we've talked about today and, and great questions, and it, it really uh, we've gotten to the root of some of the uh, things that we have going in use of KPOC right now. Some of the challenges with COVID, but also some of the exciting things that, that we're looking at uh, to move forward to the future and, uh, and to be uh, relevant. Uh, and, and adapt. The, um, 
I'd mention a couple things. Uh, I think I touched on it earlier, but we, you know, we've heard, you've heard us mention the proponent um, several times during uh, the panel today, and I would just say that with the 90 days that I've been in command, uh, I've met regularly with the uh, proponent, uh, Colonel Liddick, and we've had a lot of good two-way communications and discussing things. So, you know, that I, I think that's important because uh, going forward as, as we uh, adapt and, and uh, adjust to the manning, the equipping, the 38 Gs and all those things, uh, we're moving forward with those hand-in-hand uh, -hand with the proponent working with us. So that, that's important. I would mention that to you. The other thing uh, nobody's asking any questions about or we ha haven't discussed yet, but our airborne program, uh, that is a priority for me as well because our airborne program, uh, our utilization is not what it needs to be. So one of my priorities is to get the uh, use of KPOX airborne program and a capability uh, utilization up and re revitalized. There's some things that we're looking at, uh, but one in particular is in-house and that's just getting, uh, becoming more effective and efficient with the uh, paid parachute positions that we have, uh, the soldiers that are assigned to these units that are airborne that, but may not be in a, uh, on HDOs, on hazardous duty orders. Uh, but I share that with you because uh, it, it is a, a priority and, and we've got to get that revitalized. So uh, looking at several different, different uh, courses of action on that and a way ahead, it's not going to be something that happens quick because it's, uh, it's going to take some time to, to improve those numbers and our efficiency. But I would share that with you as well in case somebody's got some questions. Uh, barring that, um, you know, I'll open it back up for questions again. And if there are some, we'll try to answer them. If not, I'll, I'll be glad to close it out. Thank you, sir. All right, everybody, we'll hold it open for another couple of minutes. Uh, I'm monitoring the question and answer box. Nothing yet. Okay, any more questions? Uh, yes, sir. We've got one from Dr. John Black, and it somehow got buried. Hold on a second, sir. Uh, he is asking about long-term exercises and uh, I'll stand by, sir. Let me find it. Okay, sir. Uh, he asked, he's asking about thinking in years and then using that, uh, that process to create a simulation virtual environment that uh, has continuous with role players and using that to think in years as opposed to just a few, few weeks. Yeah. And have we, have we well, and that, that's a good question. I see where you're going with that question, but I tell you what's, what limits our exercises uh, and participation is uh, being reservist and you, and uh, we're allotted uh, a limit of the number of days that, that we're, we use so uh, a continual exercise like that that would not that would be a mobilization or or a deployment type thing versus uh, something we would typically do on an annual training or or uh, ADOS type orders. Now, and you know, you may have a combatant command or they may have extended uh, exercises that last longer than that, but that requires planning, coordination, how you're going to man it, uh, and that type of thing. 
but that's what drives our, our uh, exercise, the durations over. And he said, thank you, sir, in the chat. And from Dan Still, a uh, question about CPXF. Are we going to see the CPXFs going forward in FY21, given the current operating environment in COVID? Yeah, great question. So right now we're planning on two CPXs in FY21. The planning is moving forward. The um, We do plan to have them. We're, we're actually going to change locations. Uh, we're, we're not able to have it at Fort Sam Houston uh, going forward uh, due to uh, that MTC being occupied due to COVID uh, operations. So we're going to be moving to Fort McCoy. So excited about that. It has its advantages. Uh, but I met with the staff just a um, week before last, and I talked to them about uh, our planning and preparation for FY21 CPXs, and I told them to, uh, that we needed to have our CPXs and execute them regardless of COVID. If it uh, reaches a point where we're being uh, limited by COVID, we need to look at the possibility of uh, virtual or hybrid type uh, conduct of the CPXs. So again, as I mentioned earlier, we're, you know, we're, we're not going to stop training because of uh, COVID. We're just going to figure out new and innovative ways to do it. So uh, that's where we're at right now on the CPXs. Over. Hey, Jeff, Chris Stockel here. I appreciate those uh, training comments, but for the uh, target audience too, at the 351, you know, we kind of kicked off the CPXFs. And I found what really helped was good preparation and good preparation of the measles so that everyone was injected. And I'd also like to remind you, you know, when we did those CPXFs, you know, CA, PSYOP, IO, we were all involved. I remember sitting with you in the skiff uh, at 351 towards the end of my tenure. And we were talking about a PACOM program where they asked for CA, PSYOP, and IO to augment what they were looking at doing. So uh, a lot of that planning's happening. But what I always found challenging as a KCOM commander, and again, I'm a little dated now, was the, the prep, proper preparation to challenge our soldiers. So, um, uh, you know, what's the new contract look like at KPOC? Are, are we gonna get assistance, uh, uh, or is KPOC gonna get assistance for making sure we really challenge our soldiers which you had talked about now and then earlier to make sure it's the most realistic tra training. Thank you very much. Hey, Chris, good question. So, and, and that is very important. Are we giving them challenging training? Are we, uh, are we testing them to uh, see if they're uh, proficient on their skills and, and making them better? So what we're doing, the, um, one of the aspects that we've done in the past CPXs, and I mentioned about mission command systems and com communication systems training, uh, with us moving to Fort McCoy, we're looking at possibly moving that uh, communications piece out and doing that separately because it wasn't getting the full attention that it needed. But uh, we've got to, it's my intent that we're still going to, we're not going to shortchange these CPXs just because we've got some kind of restriction from COVID. It's still got to be meaningful training. And we're actually, uh, what I have seen, Chris, as we move forward and, and we've really got the units that are participating engaged with their exercise um, uh, officers that, that are throughout the planning and, and formulation of it, you know, they're doing a good job putting together these measles and adapting to whatever their situation may be or whatever they le lessons learned from the last one uh, to challenge them uh, more and more as we go forward. So, uh, you know, each time we do a CPX, it's, they, they, it's like a building block. They just build on the last one. And I, uh, I know during uh, my time as exercise director, each one got better and uh, the, uh, lots of great feedback from the soldiers. They felt like they were challenged uh, they, it kept them interested, and I think as we move forward with this uh, cognitive space, as we add that into it as well, uh, that's going to be new challenges because we've got soldiers that are so uh, 
uh, you know, they're so inquisitive and so innovative already about things like this, it's going to further pique their interest uh, to be working in the cognitive domain as well as what they do in the physical domain. All righty, sir. I've got two questions from some of our civil affairs officers that are outside of use of KPOC. Uh, one is uh, Major Newsom. He is currently at the 75th Innovation Command. Uh, and then a follow on question from uh, Jess Lagurid, if I got that right, uh, from the 79th TSC. So, Major Newsom. Um, is asking about uh, POCs or program managers in uh, for the 38 Gulf and having somebody tagged as a, a the senior representative for the the skill identifiers, someone they can that that the 38 Gulfs could contact with specific questions. Have we thought about having anybody like that? Well, you know, right now we've got. Colonel DeJesse and uh, Major Coinga has really been doing a lot of that. Is he's a, he's the go-to person. Scott, anything you want to add to that? Because that that is a good question structurally. Do we have? How are we going to continuity on that? Well, uh, to that point, sir, it's you know as we we build out um, the group of thirty-eight golfs and and organize um, and having more of the skill identifiers. Basically, there'll be a lead for each skill identifier, or at least actually a lead for the sector. And that, that can be organized to be difficult, like each individual skill identifier having, you know, being that robust. So um, that's what we're trying to do is, is get that lead person. So even though I'm a six victor, actually Lieutenant Colonel Michael De La Cruz, he is leading the really the lines of effort for the six victor. So it gets handed off to the next, the people that step up, that volunteer, that want to get involved, it's like, how much do you want? And, and we can, we have plenty to do. We have, we have 50 years plus worth of work, sir. So if anyone wants to be that person for that skill identifier, um, please reach out to me and Major Kayunga, and uh, we can, we can uh, start talking about how that can be organized the best. And then also the idea is the KCOMs, the roles they play is a very important piece and organizing their talents and where, where, where the 38 Gulfs should fit, um, depending on requirement and the missions and training that's coming up. Yeah, but again, that's a great question because, you know, there's not a uh, program manager sitting at HRC. It's been a lot of the energy from uh, dedicated people uh, that are 38 Gs like Major Coinga and, and uh, Colonel DeJesse. So uh, that's really what's uh, put a lot of energy in the recruiting and doing that. And that's something that we'll have to uh, continue or it'll it, to keep it flourishing. All righty, sir. And uh, as a follow up from you, Jesse, uh, Major Kuyenga said APAN is also a great source for following information uh, on Indian 38 golf specialties. And then, uh, sir, from Jess Lagurid, he's the G9 from the 79th TSC. And he's surprised to find that the TSCs and the ESCs have virtually no CA capability or structure. How can we work to ensure that their critical roles are filled so non-CA commands understand how to use CA in their staff processes and mission command, even when they're in garrison and specifically when deployed? Over. Yeah, that's a good question. And really it's a structural thing because, uh, you know, you don't have a, uh, a G9 or a G5, and I know whenever uh, some of the ESCs have been uh, deploying, they've come to us to fill that position when they deploy. And, you know, I know I, as a KCOM commander, I assisted. Uh, I assisted in uh, uh, providing some CA officers who might be interested to deploy with them. But, you know, that's just, that's just a structural thing that uh, it would be good to have, but typically they're uh, something that you don't get until you get ready to deploy. And, and so I, I would say you have to work on your structure or uh, figure out some 01 alphas and, and a way to take care of yourself by uh, getting a CA officer in one of those positions to provide you that expertise. But 
that's what I've seen from my past experience over. Thank you, sir. Um, and then uh, I don't know, I can't say the last name. Uh, Hermelink is talking about the airborne program and with the AGR positions that are paid parachute, how can the TPU command team influence when those positions are filled with unqualified soldiers? For example, a 92 Yankee position is coded uh, paid parachute. When they, when they show up to the unit report in, they are not airborne qualified and either not able to attend basic airborne because of a profile or pre-existing condition or just don't want to go. How can we influence that to make sure that the positions are filled by qualified people? Okay. Yeah, that's, and see, that's a good question. And that's some of the discussion that we've had just recently has been trying to look at the multi-layers of this issue to, to improve. And, and, and the first step that we're approaching is how do we, um, how do we more effectively and efficiently do with what we got in our units because we've got airborne units with paid parachute positions they don't have soldiers in them that have met the requirements or they have airborne soldiers in the units or in those positions that are not that don't have their hdos and then in this case like you mentioned with the agr that came in that's an added problem there we've got to do a better job identifying those positions and working with the uh, the uh, uh, career managers and all about getting people that are either already airborne or, or get them in there. And if they don't, then the chain of command needs to go through the process if they're not gonna fill that position or not qualified for. And that's one of the things that um, I'm emphasizing right now is that we've got to, do better in our units that have problems just like you 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 mentioned there so that's we're approaching that now and, and addressing that because uh, we got too many people that are uh, that are airborne in, in our units that don't have hdos you know they may not be able, they may have a profile or they may not be able to get one but i'm talking about the ones that are there or we've recruited people into the positions in the units and then the chain of command didn't follow through and get them to the basic airborne course. And then another thing that I would tell you is that uh, we're not gonna dig ourselves out of this by just sending people to the basic airborne course either. USART gets 250 B BAC slots a year. KPOC gets 150 of those. And we're, and we're pretty well use, using our, uh, utilizing our 150 quota. Um, we're in the process right now of looking at uh, getting uh, some additional quotas to, to help send more. But right now at that, at that level of how many we can send, we're not gonna, uh, we're not gonna get out of this, uh, uh, the, the numbers, the lack of utilization that we've got right now. But you know, I've given you a long answer, but the short answer is that's on my radar screen. and. And I'm talking to the staff about it, uh, fixing to have some up, uh, updated or revised training guidance that's going to come out and it's going to talk about that as well. Over. All right, sir. Thank you. Uh, follow on is uh, will we be able to issue HDOs at the brigade level or battalion? They currently have to go to the RRDs to get those HDOs. Um, yeah, yeah, that's a good question. We really didn't talk about uh, changing the level that you had to go to. It might speed it up, but the problem is not the speed of getting them. It's the uh, fact that we need more of them right now. So I'll take that back with me, but right now it's at the RD. And, and we, we touched on that a little bit as just a, a speed for the to get those out there. But I can tell you that's not that's not the biggest part of the problem. Okay. Thank you, sir. Now we are uh, 10 minutes out. Are there any more questions from the field? So I'm not 
haven't seen anything come across. Over to you for a closing comment, sir. Okay, thanks. Hey, again, I'd like to uh, thank you for the opportunity to spend this time with you. Uh, great questions and, and, and dialogue. That's what I wanted uh, to see here today. I hate that we're not down in Tampa, somewhere like that, but I tell you, it's great that we're still getting to do this. It, it means no less that we were able to do this virtually and, and have this dialogue. I want to thank the CA Association uh, for having me. I look forward to uh, seeing you all again in the near future when we can all get back together. Uh, great things happen at use of KPOC. Uh, I've got big shoes to fill and a big responsibility there, but I intend to uh, uh, meet that responsibility and, and move the organization forward and uh, lead these great uh, use of KPOC soldiers and, and civilians into the future. Uh, with that said, that's all I have. Uh, again, thank you. Thank you, sir. And thank you to everybody from the Civil Affairs Association and uh, around the globe for attending and participating. Ms. Stockel, over to you. Uh, super, um, uh, good conversation. Appreciate everyone's input. Um, if there's no sidebars going on, I'll hang on for about 30 seconds and then I'll uh, shut down the recording and uh, I guess we'll pick it back up tomorrow with some more exciting uh, panels. Thank you everyone for all your support.